Thanks very much for coming. It's fantastic to be back, not just in Belgium, but in this room. Um, who am I? Well, some of you might know me. I'm James. I'm from Cojurance now. I used to be from ThoughtWorks, and um, yeah, I moved. Um, ThoughtWorks is still great. Cojurance is still great. What am I going to talk about today? Well, firstly, why am I standing on stage here saying Agile is still a dirty word? Then I'm going to talk through the problem, what dirty looks like, how we might move on. The journey, this is the most important part. When I stood on this stage last year, it's not really a stage actually, is it? It's a floor. But when I stood here last year and talked about this, I talked a lot about the problem space and I didn't have a great deal to talk about the solution space. Since then, a lot of what I spoke about a year ago has moved forward. And when I was at ThoughtWorks, we started to actually write down this stuff and codify and use it. So hopefully I've got some insights on, on how to get past this problem of Agile being a dirty word. Right. Has anybody recognized this? It's a Eurostar ticket. So um, it says in there, London St. Pancras to any Belgian station. Now, I, I mean, I speak English reasonably well. Now, in my book, Antwerp is, falls under the auspices of any Belgian station. So I got to Brussels. And I went through customs, which, I mean, admittedly, I wasn't in a great mood at the time, but um, they stopped and emptied my bags. That's never happened to me before. Um, so maybe I was already in a bad mood. But when I got onto this train at, at Brussels Station, they kicked me off and said, well, they basically said that. And um, this guy said, you can't come on a train. You've got the wrong ticket. And I said, well, my ticket says any, any station in Belgium. And he said, yeah, but not this train. And I was like, OK. Fine. Uh, it wasn't a great experience. But then, that was Brussels. I get to Antwerp. I love Antwerp. Antwerp Station is the only station that I know of in the world that is on three stories. The trains come in above each other. It's amazing. It's absolutely, truly fantastic. And better than that, when you get outside, surely that exterior has to be one of the world's great buildings. It's, it's up there with London St. Pancras. Last year when I came, I took a similar picture on the way out. I didn't even realize, because this time I was walking to the hotel, that it has this other view that looks like that, which is oh, equally amazing. What a wonderful building that is. So then this morning, uh, I was working in a cafe. Unfortunately, I had to do real work today, which is something I don't really take too keenly to. But um, I was in a cafe. Why was I in a cafe? Well, the hotel I booked myself into looked like a prison cell. and I. I really did not want to do my day's work in that prison cell. It, it didn't feel that great. So that, that was kind of my morning. And then this afternoon, um, I had a bit of a late lunch. I went for a run, which, as you can see, I thought I was running straight from where the hotel was to find where, the, um, where this place is. As you can see, it didn't quite go according to plan. But it was fun nonetheless. But just to prove I did get here, I took a picture. So that, that, was, that was how I got here. Oh, yeah, but. I have had a shower and change since, so let's move on, let's move on. So, well, so, oh, so how did that get there? Uh, tomorrow afternoon, room nine it says at the moment, but I know that they arrange the rooms, you know, so if you like my talk, like that talk, maybe it will get moved into this room. We'll have enough of an audience to see in here. It's a great talk, that one, that's my favorite talk. Anyway, you're my favorite audience member. <laughs> okay, so. Let's have a bit of the history. Why is Agile still a dirty word? This is last year. That's a year ago in this room. Now, uh, this is usually where my talks go wrong. This is where I'm going to show you a quick video. I was in the Ukraine last week doing a, um, well, basically doing this talk. Before I went to that conference, they asked me to make a promotional video. So I did. Um, and since it's the same talk a week later, I'm going to show you the promotional video. Here we go. Who he is. Absolutely no idea. 
So that's why I'm standing on this stage saying this stuff. Uh, if this goes according to plan, it'll be amazing. Oh, what have I done with my glasses? Oh, they're in my pocket. Excuse me. Okay, so this is why I'm talking about agile as a dirty word. So um, I'm going to start with uh, anybody that was here last year, please don't shout the answers out. Does anybody know what country that is? Laos, well done. And that one? Algeria, thank you, this one. Congo, this one. It's a bit harder, sorry. T less, T more less, thank you. And this one. God, I can't even remember myself. Oh, that's Ethiopia. This one's easy, it's the, the dark green one. And this one. Sri Lanka, and finally this one. Okay, does anybody that didn't see this last year want to hazard a guess as to what those eight countries have in common? You can smoke there, I think I heard someone say. <laughs> I think you can smoke everywhere, but smoking inside is a different matter, although the bar I was in yesterday, people were smoking inside, which uh, you know, meant I had to change my jeans. Um, well, the, 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 the answer is that these are the eight countries in the world whose official name contains the word democratic. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to whether these countries are or are not democratic? <laughs> well, let's have a look, because th helpfully there is something called the Democracy Index. So we can see that all these democratic countries, well, they're not. <laughs> so just, just for a bit of balance, does anybody want to excuse me, hazard a guess as to what the world's most democratic country is, according to the Democracy Index? Sweden, not a bad guest nearby. Anybody else? It's the Kingdom of Norway. Anybody? Where do you think the UK is? I'm from the UK. I think someone said 14 there. They've obviously seen this before. What about Belgium? Belgium, higher or lower than the UK? Lower? Higher? I, I don't want to be passive-aggressive, but... That surprised me, believe me. There are five categories. If you're interested, you can Google it. That It scores very lowly in two categories, and it scores very highly in three of the five categories, and that's why it's down the list a bit. Why am I saying this? Well, because it seems to me there's a pattern there. Those countries, and it reminds me of the Eastern Bloc back in the Soviet days where the... Um, uh, East Germany was called the Democratic Republic of Germany, <laughs> really. And, you know, there was the Democratic People's Republic of, of uh, Romania and so on. It feels like to me that when people have to brag about something, where they have to broadcast something, they're probably not that thing, right? Otherwise, why would they be doing it, okay? And what I've noticed in my career in recent years is that sometimes you find a CTO who says something like this. I used to have a little ThoughtWorks picture for CTOs, now I've got my cat. Um, and often you see job descriptions where people are trying to entice you to work for the company, and they'll mention the word agile a few times, but then they'll balls that up by saying scrum. And they'll, they'll brag about being agile because they think that that's going to attract people. And, and I, I just think that that's a symptom of people not understanding what agile is, if they feel like they have to go out and broadcast it. So, <clears throat> Let's move on to the problem. Why, why did Agile ever become a dirty word? Well, this is something I've been thinking about in, well, since a year ago when I first did this talk. I think some of us, or all of us, have gone through this type of journey. Back in 1999, 1990-ish, everything failed. I, I can remember having no idea how projects were managed and everything I did failed. I reckon I was a software professional for six or seven years before I ever actually got anything in production. It, seriously, 
I know people are laughing, that's not a joke. Later on, you find that people said things like, well, XP's good, let's give that a go. I've heard that works, and I remember giving talks on XP back in the late 90s, and of course, things kept failing, right? So at some point, somebody in your organization said, well, XP's a load of crap, right? There must be a better way. So then later on, I don't know, for a big span, people started saying, Agile's cool. And you know what they did? They retrained all these project managers that were Prince2 certified, and they did scrum training. And then they said to the world, we're Agile, great. What happens? Oh, wow, all our stuff still fails. So Agile's now a dirty word, right? Because Agile's the latest in a long line of stuff that people are blaming for all these failures. But let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. What happens in all of those things is that your deliveries fail. What else happens? Well, we've got, in English, I think we call this the first person pronoun. We've, it appears eight times in that description. So what's the common thread? Well, the common thread is that it's our software deliveries that fail. Our software deliveries. So maybe we're the problem. Maybe we should stop blaming the methodologies that we think we're using. Maybe we should stop blaming some philosophy that we think is, is not helping necessarily. And maybe we should look in the mirror. Maybe we should ask ourselves, maybe we're not doing this stuff right. That's how Agile became a dirty word. So what does dirty look like? A bit like that rugby scene there. I'm quite pleased with that picture. Has anybody worked with this cycle of declining trust. Let's see. Put your hand up if you recognize this as it goes. Something bad happened, right? I think we've all been in that situation. And someone comes along and says, we're going to standardize on tools. Or maybe they say we're going to standardize on process. Maybe they say we're going to add this extra layer of stuff in there to make sure that that bad thing that happens cannot happen again. What's the result of that extra regulation, that extra tool set, that standardization? Well, generally speaking, the result is things don't work well for everybody. Everybody is now forced to do stuff in a way that doesn't suit their use case. Well, um, what's the consequence of that? Well, your, your software team, your delivery people cannot get shit done. It's just impossible because they're not being allowed to deliver value. They're not being allowed to do the one thing that they should be being tasked to do, which is to deliver on customer outcomes. So what then happens? Well, more bad stuff happens. It's a cycle of declining trust. And what happens in this situation? Nobody trusts our software developers. That's the end game that a lot of companies end up in. This type of cycle ends up with no trust to your software delivery organization. And I... I can't remember when I first did this slide, it was sometime in the last couple of years. The company I'm working for now basically is at risk of having its biggest customer drop it. So I agreed to take over the, the running that particular project. And I said to them, look, the whole thing is down to lack of trust. Our client no longer trusts us. We need to rebuild that trust. And here's my, it was a bit of a guess. This is, um, I've exactly reproduced the slide, except I've taken out the, the brand names of those concerned to protect the innocent. I said to my client, I think this is what happened, right? Our business has lost confidence. Actually, originally it said our client, but it was a named client, so I had to change it. But this happens internally as well, stuff like this. Why did they lose confidence? Because we're going to do a release, and no one's got confidence that that release is going to be successful. Because they remember the last release we did. They remember the last time that we ended the world of Warcraft. So, what does that mean? Well, I need the glasses, apologies. Oh no, it's big enough there. Nobody believes that it's going to be successful because we cannot do the right kind of automated testing and quality assurance. Why? Because we don't have the right tooling or disciplines to implement CI, CD effectively. You can change the exact sequence of this to fit your case. And because our QA function and developers are too far away from the customer, this is the biggest dysfunction in my current client. And that's causing the feedback loops on any changes to be far too large. And what's the natural consequence of that? We get less confidence in our system, which is causing a vicious cycle of declining trust. And when I showed this slide to the board members of my current client, they were like, how long have you worked here? And I said, well, I've been here for five weeks. And they said, how do you know all that? What did you do? 
I said, well, I spoke to everybody internally. I thought, well, I could have used a template from my last engagement. But... <laughs> Which leads me to this cycle as well. Um, I, I think everybody's found this in their lifetime at, at one point. Both of these cycles were in the same presentation that I was just talking about. Someone does a bad release, right? A release that fails, a release that causes problems. Every software delivery goes through this at one point or another. What happens? What's the natural response to that bad release? Well, often it's that. Someone says, we need to do more testing. Maybe that's reasonable. But the way that that plays out is that it always ends up being, you need to have a two-week testing cycle after your two-week delivery cycle. And it's like, oh, God. You are making the situation worse and worse. So what does that testing thing normally mean? It doesn't mean invest in sensible automated testing often. What it means is that um, we're going to write some scripts and make sure someone does end-to-end -end testing and all this bad, sorry, good stuff. Yeah. What does that lead to? Well, it leads to longer cycles because all of that testing takes time, right? So it means that we're going to have longer cycles. And what that means is we're releasing more stuff. If we release more stuff, more stuff can go wrong. Not only that, you will not know what went wrong. If you release one thing, one thing caused it to go wrong. If you release two things, don't kid yourself that there are two things that could have caused that problem. There isn't. There's three. There is thing one, thing two, and the interaction between thing one and thing two. If you release three things, thing one, thing two, thing three, the interact, there are now three interreactions going on. It's, in, it's on the order of n squared if you release n things. I've worked in companies, the current one I'm working in, that are releasing like 30 things at once. It cannot succeed. Not only can it not succeed, you won't know what went wrong. You will just be in a world of pain. So those longer cycles basically mean more things are released. What does more things being released mean? Oh, what a surprise. You've done a bad release. Time and time and time again. That's the cycles that we find ourselves in when everything has gone wrong. And this is the type of situation where people start throwing mud around and saying, agile is the thing here. Agile has gone wrong. It is not agile. It is everything else in your organization. A natural consequence of all this stuff, if we look where it says in, in this slide, it says more testing. That could equally say more procedure, more stuff, as it did on the last slide. We end up with something called risk management theater. Risk management theatre is when you have a load of process that nobody really understands what it's for anymore. You can approach people in the organisation and say, what outcome does this process support? Nobody knows. And what often happens is that a big department has evolved to support this process. Change management is the biggest um, repeat offender in this space. And nobody really understands what that function does anymore, except there's a director of it and a big team and a structure, and loads of people's lives depend on it, and someone's owning that empire. So it's virtually impossible to get rid of. And I can give you a real-world example of risk management theater, and I urge everybody to take this as a tip. When you're trying to illustrate to your company, to your client, whatever it is, how things can go bad, look for examples in the real world. This is a photograph I took when I was walking with my daughter into town where I live in the UK, Hemel Hempstead. As you can probably see, it says, caution, broken glass. Can anybody see the broken glass in that picture? Yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. It's there. Oh, you're still struggling, really? <laughs> I'll help you again. There it is. Now, the interesting thing about this picture is that look at the effort they've gone to to secure that position. And what you can't see up the top there is that those plastic fence things are actually physically properly attached to those iron railings. This stayed like this for at least three weeks. Because every week I walked to the town centre with my daughter and I checked if it was still there. So this situation persisted for at least three weeks. My conjecture is that somebody once in this area cut their foot on a piece of broken glass or injured themselves on broken glass. So somebody else's reaction to that was to say, we need a procedure to make sure that doesn't happen again. And step one in that procedure said, secure the area. This is the result. 
How much do you think that cost? I don't know. I'm, I'm frightened to say. But why didn't the person, instead of going to all that trouble, just clear up that broken glass? It would have taken five minutes. So here are, for me, this is where bad ends. The, these are the, what I would consider to be the anti-agile, dysfunctional, organizational smells. I think we've all worked with bad funding models where they expect you to be agile, but they only give you funding for two years. There's, there will be a blame culture in all places where agile is a dirty word. There will be silos. Agile will be getting the blame for not getting things done when the real problem can be silos. For me, the biggest one is that fourth bullet. I should probably promote it to the top. If your organization treats technology as a cost to the business, you will be in a world of pain. You get dishonest watermelon reporting. Watermelons are green on the outside, red on the inside. It's when everybody says on their project, green, 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 green. Oh, no, it's red like a week before delivery. There'll be lack of trust within your organization. We already spoke to that. And everybody will be driven by process, and nobody will understand the outcomes they're supporting. So how do we clean it up? Tip number one. There are dirty words out there. Agile is a dirty word. MVP is another dirty word in a lot of organizations. They've had bad experiences with MVPs in the past, generally speaking, because they don't understand what an MVP is. So my top tip about an MVP is to talk about delivering quick value and quick learning. And here's a, here's a good example. That's my friend Fu that I used to work with at ThoughtWorks. We needed to make a picture for a newsletter that went to ThoughtWorks. And I wanted to do that thing where there's a green glow on people's face to show they're a hacker. You used to get it in 24. And if anybody's old enough apart from me and remembers war games, you always used to get the green glow on the face of the person tapping at the computer. So this is the picture we put in the newsletter, right? How did we do it? How did we make our low-tech MVP? Well, we did it like that. And I've used this picture to illustrate to my clients what it means to have an MVP. This picture proved that there was a market for green glow on the face. I know I can sell this idea now, so all I have to do is industrialize the bit with the mobile phone torch and the, and the green water bottle. So avoid those dirty words. But you know what? I think people really need to understand what Agile means, and I don't think people do. So you need to understand that Scrum is not synonymous with Agile. Too often people talk about Scrum. Uh, Kanban is a bit better, in my view, but equally that's not Agile. It's just a thing that might support Agile stuff. What Agile really is, is a set of four value statements and 12 principles. It's that. Concentrate on those. Here's the four Agile values. I'm hoping people in this room have looked at the Agile Manifesto. It's great stuff. Look at it and, and value that stuff. I shouldn't say value because I'm overloading the term, but look at it, believe it, and ask yourself, do we really follow these things, right? Because if you follow these values, you'll find that everything else starts falling in your way. Then you look at the 12 Agile principles, and this is a technique we use at ThoughtWorks to avoid the dirty word. Look at the dysfunctional organization you're in. Look at those 12 Agile uh, principles and ask yourself, which ones are we following and which ones are we not? Then you can make a presentation, which is basically an Agile 101, but no one's going to go to an Agile 101 because everyone thinks they're Agile, right? So call it that or something similar. And that was the title we came up with back in July 2018, that says. Actually, it dates back to a year before that. A colleague of mine said, what's the problem with this company you've just moved into? And I said, they don't understand Agile. And she said, well, why don't you do Agile 101? And I said, well, because they'll probably kill me. Because <laughs> that's like walking into a room of experienced people and saying, you're all shit at your job. So she gave me a title that was similar to that. I can't remember exactly what it was. And it evolved into that. And I've got a template, or we've got a template, that allows us to highlight whichever of the, the Agile values, principles they're not following but using that title. So it's like giving an Agile 101 without ever saying the word Agile. There's our favorite CTO again. She's great, isn't she? It's not actually my cat. I said it was my cat, but it's not. This, this is one of the few presentations I've got that doesn't have a picture of my daughter's cat in it. But that's just a high-res picture of an, uh, an arbitrary cat. So people go and say we're Scrum certified. 
It's incredible. You can't buy Agile off a shelf, right? I've seen so many big organizations go and say exactly that. I think I already mentioned this. We'll send all our project managers that were PRINCE2 certified and get them to be Scrum certified. And then I even worked for a client five years ago where they had a big board, um, which was ironic because it was a whiteboard with you know, stickies on it. And it said number of Agile projects. And what that meant was <laughs> the number of projects whose project manager had been rebranded as a Scrum master. They changed nothing else. So none of those methodologies are really Agile, right? If you don't have the Agile values underpinning it and the Agile principles and, and you don't buy into those, you're not Agile. Um, I had a big polemic last year about SAFE. Um, I'm not going to go through the same business, but this to me is the epitome of anti-Agile. If you think you have to do this shit, you are doing stuff wrong. I don't think SAFE is Agile. I don't think it's SAFE. I think it should... I think it's missing a U and an N at the start of its name. What is it really? It's pretend agile so that directors can tell their investors that they're agile. I wanted to find ways of illustrating what agile meant to me. So I had seen such things as agile pyramids before. This is by no means the agile pyramid. It's one that I found. It annoys me because it, seems, because it has methods at the bottom, as if it's saying, if you do the methods, everything else will follow. I think a telltale sign is that there's uh, some consultancy or other has their copyright logo on there. I don't know who they are. So that one I reject. I think, you know, this is... Methods don't underpin everything else. So I found another one. This one I've... I've I'm, oh, that's a crap picture, isn't it? This one I'm slightly less uncomfortable with, apart from the fact that in the middle it has management practices. And I just think, you know, one of the values, one of the core values of Agile, Lean, everything else, is that you don't manage, you empower. So to have management practices in there, I just think is absolutely wrong-headed. And the fact that it has Agile values at the top instead of the bottom annoys me as well. So I went around and eventually I, I decided to make my own Agile pyramid. I'm, obviously, I'm not the only person in the world that thinks they understand Agile. Uh, but this is the, my take on it. Right at the bottom, the Agile manifesto should be the thing that underpins everything we do, everything that we believe about Agile. And that means the values and the principles. Those values, those principles, what they should be supporting is empowerment, trust, and a belief in outcomes over processes. What I mean is, all of your teams should be empowered to own an outcome and deliver on it. Don't tell them how to do it. Tell them what they need to deliver. And right at the top, I would put, oh my God, that didn't work, that slide. <laughs> that should say engineering excellence, obviously. Let's, let's just pretend you didn't see that slide for a moment. There's, this is Agile in, uh, in action. That was a quick feedback loop. So let's do that slide again. Let's pretend we just did that and that. Right at the top, you have engineering excellence. <laughs> I've never got a round of applause in the middle of a slide before. That's brilliant. <laughs> that was a genuine fuck up. I was, <laughs> I, was, I was going through the deck in the pub like an hour ago, and I, I didn't spot that. So that's, that's my view on the Agile Pyramid. So um, avoid dirty words. My next point is, actually, you can sometimes talk the language of your clients of your dysfunction. Waste, you will find, is a word that resonates. Even in the most dysfunctional places, if we talk about waste, that's something that people will listen to. People intrinsically understand what waste is. Can anybody see the waste in this picture, by the way? The context is, this was me. Um, last year, England were in the semi-final of the World Cup, um, as were Belgium. Um, we lost, so did Belgium. This, this is the aftermath where I'm tidying up. Uh, I was at a conference, so I watched it in the... Can anyone see where the waste is in that picture? Yes, that's right. It's the beer on the floor. Because my value stream was getting drunk, because I wasn't particularly happy. It's nothing in the bins, it's not those bags, it's the beer on the floor. My point for showing this is that waste isn't necessarily obvious to your clients, to your people in your company. Because the biggest culprit for waste is queuing time. And if you have, for example, if you go through um, things like code review and things sit in waiting for review for a day, that is the biggest problem in your system, most likely. 
So it's not always obvious what waste is, but it's a, it's a conversation that will resonate with people. And I think once you start having that conversation, people will start to focus on their, on their outcomes. Because if you start to say to people, that queuing time is waste, they will start to understand that their real job, what they ought to be doing, is not to follow some process and not to slavishly do stuff, but they'll concentrate on the outcome of getting stuff live into production. So that's a good conversation you can have. You will find enemies when you're trying to get transformation done. You will annoy people, uh, and I love this quote. Uh, it says, if you haven't annoyed people, you're probably not trying hard enough. So just a quick story on that. This is from last week. I got this email because essentially our client was telling us to use an installation of Jira that isn't fit for purpose. Uh, this is extracts from his email. I, I won't have you read through it. I'll read the highlights. Uh, so we don't have access to Jira from their laptops. Yeah, we don't. Uh, it's not acceptable or safe. This really annoyed me because my cousin works on the rigs in Scotland. He works on oil rigs, right? That's a proper job that people can die in. For somebody to tell me it's not safe to use Jira is guaranteed to get me very angry. <laughs> and then he goes through 10 points. And this, this one was a really telling comment. If we need to lose a day in the sprint, I will take the heat. He has lost sight of the outcomes that we should be driving towards. If he thinks it's important for me to not be blamed for stuff, that to me is extremely worrying. Then he goes on to say this. I don't even understand what that means. <laughs> it spawned a thread of 27. Actually, that 27 has grown since uh, I first made this slide. Here is one of the responses I made. Again, I won't make you read it, but it's about talking their language. I genuinely timed how long it took me to open a Jira card. It was 68 seconds. And as you can see, I pointed out that if I open 100 tickets, which is not unreasonable for a leader, I'm going to waste 68 minutes. Actually, can anybody see my maths floor there? It's not 68 minutes. It's something like an hour and 13 minutes that it would have wasted. I don't know why I got to 68 minutes there. I think I was using base 100 instead of base 60, but hey. And then I point out this. If we use the cloud version, it will cost $7 per user per month. Why are we not using the cloud version? So that's my point. Uh, in, in this instance, if you sometimes have to talk the language of the people that don't understand Agile, do so. You can make a point that will resonate with everybody. A cost argument will resonate with, with the most transient people. So that whole thread, let's go through bingo from my earlier slide. Dysfunctional waterfall funding models, I think that's in there. That's the bit about the $75,000 capex. Blame culture, for sure, because he told me I wouldn't get blamed. So obviously there's a blame culture going on. There are silos because what I didn't show you there was they had to raise a ticket to fix this issue. They've agreed to raise a ticket. Uh, technology is a cost center for sure because they care about us accounting for, for our time. Uh, lack of trust and empowerment, most definitely. They don't trust us to do our work. They're definitely process and outcome driven. I can't find an example in that email thread about dishonest watermelon reporting, but the client does it, so I'm gonna tick it anyway. <laughs> My next tip is everybody loves a metaphor. We all know tech debt, don't we? You want to try and teach your people what tech debt means? Here's how you do it. That's how you start to tell people to invest in tech debt. Right. I'm going to go through an actual case study now, a team that I work with. The first thing we did was talk about the goals and the values of the team. And I would urge everybody to do this. If you ask a team in your organization, what do you do? Give me one succinct sentence about what it is that you do. I will be shocked if most of your teams can answer that effectively. What you might end up with is, is a sentence with the word and in it three times. Well, that's not one thing, right? That shows that you don't understand what it is that you do. It shows that you have different stakeholders, different priorities, and so on. It's not very good to operate in those circumstances. So this is the genuine output from me doing this workshop with the last team I worked for at ThoughtWorks. And we came up with, we're the platform engineering team. Our purpose is to enable, I can't even read my own writing, other product teams to deliver value with minimal effort. And there are earlier iterations crossed out there. That's the genuine output from that. We then decided to talk about three or four comparative value statements. And I uh, absolutely unashamedly ripped this off from the Agile Manifesto. So the goal is to say, um, we value this over this. 
And the reason why that's useful is that it helps you prioritize things and it helps you deal with uh, people in your business that come to you and say, I want you to do this when actually you want to do something else. You say, well, that doesn't fit our values. So we ended up with, we value maintainability over micro-optimization. We value shared ownership over, no, shared ownership and context over individual silos and something else I can't read. Uh, meeting current, real current customer needs over elaborate solutions. That was the first thing I did with that team when I was introduced to it. It was not working. It, it had a, a lot of problems in getting stuff done. And this is what happened over the next six weeks. I was asked to do a ways of working exercise and somebody asked me at ThoughtWorks, can I reorganize exactly how they do stuff? And I said, no, I don't want to do that. If I impose a new methodology on them and say, this is how we're going to do things. I'm as guilty as the people that come along and talk about Scrum or talk about SAFE or talk about all this stuff. I want them to understand their outcomes they're driving towards and get to their own conclusions about what they need to do. So the first thing we did um, was to map out their process, which is the green stickies on there. This went over three um, bits of paper. There's more green, I oh, know it's two. Um, we did all the green things. That took um, two weeks to get to that stage in, in sessions of an hour. Once we'd done all the green stickies, we started adding the pink stickies, which were little notes of explanation. And then the most important step was we, those blue stickies on the last two slides, those are the outcomes. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Those are the outcomes that are served by the green stickies. So what I was getting everybody to focus on, these are the outcomes that are important, right? So I don't care what the process is, you get to them, these are the outcomes. And it turned out that shared context came up again and again and again and again. Why do we do code review? To share the context. Why do we do handover? To share the context. Right, is there a better way to do that? Can we do it earlier? So what we then moved on to eventually was the orange stickies are representing the rituals that they go through and the blue stickies are where the outcomes that we care about are being delivered. And as you can see, there's only one, two, three, four, four things in there that have a blue sticky on, so we just dropped everything else because it wasn't delivering any value. Now, the key point of going on here is that everybody bought into it because everybody's making the decision. I made none of these decisions. The team made all the decisions about what was sensible, what our outcomes are important, and so on. So what then happened was the team starts buying in. This is the team actually, but functioning as a team, which they previously hadn't done. They were always working with earphones on. They were always working at home. They weren't working together. And then eventually, I was handing over. We ended up with a, a Kanban board like that, as you can see. Um, when I first joined the team, there was no Kanban board, there was no visibility of the work, and there was over 30 things in progress. And we had pressure all over the business saying to us, do this, do this, do this. And I said, no, the first thing we're doing is clearing away this backlog of stuff so that we've got no work in progress. Then we did that. And as you can see, the right-hand column, the done column, has got the most stuff in it. And eventually, the end game was this guy is one of our clients. This is him running a workshop himself. We've handed everything over. He's now confident enough to run a workshop. He's looking a bit scared at the start, and this is him at the end, looking slightly happier, I hope. So steps on the journey here. Number one, understand Agile. Two, it's useful to use analogies, metaphors, to help people understand. Pragmatic, that helps sometimes. Sometimes if you speak the language that people understand, that can help. Change one thing at a time. In that story that I just went through, we only change one thing in the procedure at a time. If you change a load of stuff all at once, just like doing a Big Bang release, you won't know what broke the stuff, you won't know what worked. So when you're changing procedures, do it one thing at a time. Do it in ways that people can understand. But most importantly, empower everybody, involve everybody, and remember, you'll upset people, so deal with it. What does good look like? I won't spend too much time on this. Conway's law, um, we should have cross-functional teams that are empowered to deliver on their own outcomes. I like the third quote there. Uh, I'm reading The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, you, you should probably take a photo if you care about this book because it's not on the last slide. Um, and in that book, he says that the one company that was a competitor of DEC opened up a computer they'd bought from DEC. This was back in the 80s. And he said, we could see their org chart inside the product. That's Conway's law in action. But equally, Christensen goes on to say in that same quote, if it works that way around, it can work the other way around. 
if the organization defines the products we can make, why don't we start from the products and then define the organization? And that's a really powerful message. That's what we used to call the reverse Conway maneuver. You can do that in any organization. It will cause pain, but you can do it. So this is the state you want to get to. You want to have autonomous, cross-functional teams, and you want them to be decoupled as much as possible. I want everybody to work towards having a learning culture, not a blame culture. Yes, we do retros. Yes, we do wash-ups or um, post-mortems, but we do that to learn. We don't do it to blame. That's really important. So a blame, uh, sorry, <laughs> a learning culture. How do we do that? Book clubs are great. Do a book club. Get together, read a book between you. Meet every week and talk about the next five chapters in a book. I thoroughly recommend all those books, but it's on a later slide, so you don't need to photograph it. Do your brown bags. Get together, encourage everybody to give a presentation once a week. It really works. And here's the big takeaway. How do I keep my organization clean? How do I make it so that we, are, we continue to be a powerful, high-performing delivery organization? Actually, I'll take the word delivery out. How do we make ourselves a high-performing organization and make sure we stay that way? This is an interesting quote, and I think it's really powerful. If you think your business has a competitive advantage, if it's not that, you don't. The only competitive advantage you can ever give yourself is the ability to learn and react quicker to the market conditions than your competitors. Nothing else, anything else is an illusion. Make sure you have retros and make sure you read Norm Kerr's quote, the, uh, the prime directive of retros. You need a true learning or, or oh, sorry, I cut some slides out here because it took too long in Kiev last week. Be careful what you measure. Um, I love this quote as well. Um, if you measure the wrong stuff, you'll get the wrong behavior. Simple fact. If, for example, if you think that it's sensible to measure um, uh, code, uh, test code coverage, that's a ridiculous metric. I can, I can get 100% code coverage by writing a unit test that just runs through the code and doesn't make an assertion. Is that helpful? Does that help me get the right outcome? Of course it doesn't. So be careful what you measure. This is useful. People understand this stuff. N not necessarily this, but um, the message there is, are we really a tech company? Most companies are down this end somewhere, or at least that I work with, because otherwise they wouldn't need consultants, right? They must be terrible. This is something we did uh, a few months ago, is to say we, we broke down the axis of where tech sits within the business, on, a, on certain axes. And this type of messaging and this type of measurement is really useful because you can move that client forward or you can move your business forward by saying, where are we on these axes? We need to move to the right. That's what we need to do and we need to relentlessly move to the right. So how do we move to the right in that and how do we stay there? I was talking earlier to one of the other speakers, Guy, Guy Rouse, about understanding the success of architectural changes. I think often we don't. Somebody says, let's use Kafka because it's more scalable. It will help us to get more decoupling in our system. Or something else. Like, How do you know that your system is more decoupled now than it was yesterday? Do people measure this? My message is you should. Try and understand a way to understand the success or the failure of that architectural change. Always ask yourself the question, if we do this thing, what will it look like, to, what will it look like tomorrow that it didn't look like today, and how will we be able to know that? And that's something that we should all be doing. This is how you keep your organization healthy. This is how you keep moving forward. Um, so how do I write these fitness functions that will help me understand the success of changes or the failure of changes? Well, um, I don't know. Um, I do have some ideas, though. Um, there's a great book called Building Evolutionary Architectures, where a lot of this thinking comes from. Um, it doesn't, it's light on descriptions of how to make these um, uh, measures. But, for example, I suggested, um, oh, it's on the slide there. We started measuring the coupledness of our system by measuring the total hours that tech leads spent in meetings. I know it's not an exact science. But if you decouple the system further, tech leads will have to go to fewer meetings. So that's a good way of measuring it over time. You can get a trend analysis. That's what you're looking for. You're not looking for absolute good or bad values. But be creative in them. Uh, you can use Jenkins and Jira, for example, to get metrics uh, that are useful. And these 
are the only metrics you should care about. Um, Accelerate, uh, a great book by um, the same people that brought us um, DevOps Handbook. Those four key metrics, lead time, deployment frequency, mean time to restore, and change file percentage. Not only are they highly correlated with high um, organizational performance, they are leading indicators of high organizational performance. Any successful change to your architecture will positively impact those four things. If you only measure them, you will have a healthy system. So I urge people to understand what they mean on just an organizational level and a team level and to keep measuring them, to understand everything. How do you do that? Well, the book Accelerate helpfully tells us that there are 24 capabilities that drive those four key metrics. If you improve in those 24 key capabilities, it has been shown by science and statistics that I don't necessarily directly understand that you will improve those four key metrics. So what we then came up with a year ago that we're now putting into action, we've seen great success of, is the five steps for your framework for continual improvement. I'm ripping off the goal a bit here, but this is what we came up with. Step number one, list out the 24 key capabilities. Step two, uh, one section is organizational stuff. It doesn't apply to a team, but you do this on every level of magnification. Do it with the boards, do it with your teams, do it with the divisions, whatever. So there are some that don't apply because they're on a bigger level of magnification. Decide the single capability that you are bad at, that you are worst at. Forget the other 23, pick out the one that is the worst. Get a simple action in that room about how you're going to improve that capability. Don't worry about the others. Don't worry about any other problems. Just fix your biggest problem. And step number five, come back two weeks later and see if it's still the biggest problem. You keep doing that every two weeks on a constant basis. You will find that you constantly improve the four key metrics and the overall health of your organization will not only improve but will stay improved and continue to improve. So, I hope everybody took that in. That was the most important slide. Exec summary, understand agile principles and values. Outcome over process every time. Make small, easy to understand changes. I would recommend one thing at a time. Measure only the stuff that really matters, which means the four key metrics. Relentlessly learn and improve. And there's a framework there on the earlier slide about how to do that. Then maybe, just maybe, you'll find that agile will no longer be a dirty word. Oh, sorry, there's that again. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>